Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Lori Hawthorne. I am the Events Director for the ETO Conferences, and we're really excited to welcome everyone to um, our webinar, um, Ask the Experts. Sites for Success in China's e-commerce market. And we will feature speakers from CD Networks, Newegg, and Puma. I would like to do just a few housekeeping remarks. To enable presentation audio, please turn on your computer speakers. Questions from the audience are welcome. You can submit your questions using the Q&A tab. Questions will be responded to during the last 10 minutes of the webinar. And the presentation will be recorded and distributed to everyone who is registered for the webinar. Okay? Now we'd like to welcome our webinar panelists for today. First, we have Aaron Yin. He's the Head of Marketing Management and Director of Customer Acquisition for Newegg.com. Aaron, can you do a brief introduction for the audience? Yeah, sure. Um, this is Aaron from Newegg. Uh, I have been in Newegg for more than nine years. Uh, always doing uh, marketing for New Egg, and uh, right now it's uh, out of a market manager office, and also taking care of our cost acquisition. Uh, very nice to meet you guys. Thank you, Aaron. Next, we have Audrey Cosin. She's the director of global e-commerce uh, at Puma. Audrey, can you do a brief introduction for the audience? Sure. Hello, my name is uh, Audrey. Uh, I'm currently global director of e-commerce at Puma. Um, reporting into the global head of e-commerce. Um, I've been with Puma for a little bit over two and a half years now. Uh, I'm primarily involved in managing the launch of Puma e-commerce sites in new markets, um, and I'm more specifically involved in the entry strategy, systems architecture, uh, vendor selection, and operation setup, uh, and then overall project management, and this is why I've been involved uh, for Puma um, on the expansion in China. And prior to that, I worked for five years at Caring, which is the parent company of Puma. Okay, perfect. And finally, we have Sharon Bell, who's the Director of Marketing Americas at EMEA um, at CD Networks. Sharon, can you do an introduction? Sure. Um, so I've been with CD Networks for a couple years, and we are a multinational content delivery network we have expertise in infrastructure in many emerging markets, including China and Russia, Mexico, South America, uh, Middle East. We accelerate uh, more than 40,000 global websites, and we have 140 points of presence around the, the world. And prior to CD, network, CD Networks, I've held marketing positions with high-tech companies for about 25 years. Okay, perfect. So Sharon is going to do an introduction uh, for the audience, and she has some slides that will accompany her introduction. And then we're going to have some specific questions for both Audrey and Aaron. So Sharon, I will turn this back over to you. Great. Thank you. I'll keep this brief. Um, we are uh, basically wanted to present today um, based on a report that, that we did with Flashman Hillard on um, the e-commerce, um, basically market, the market within China, um, providing a deeper understanding of the market, insights on how global retailers are able to reach China and achieve success in China. And we've provided a, a link on your um, presentation console that goes directly to that report so you can get a copy of that. Um, so today I'm just going to cover a couple points from the report, online shopper behavior and trends, and then we'll move into our discussion with um, Puma and Newegg, and they'll share their insights into the e-commerce market in China, challenges, suggestions for success, and all, all of that. So, um, so let's see. So just you know, start, starting out, I think everybody knows that, that China is fabulous for e-commerce. Um, China also has a huge internet population. They added 54 million internet users last year for a total of 618 million, and it's more than any other country in the world. And China treats the internet like a 24-hour shopping mall. Um, and since 2003, revenue from e-commerce has grown at a compound annual rate of 120% a year. And it's slowed a little bit since then, but um, it's still going at about 70% compounded annually from 2009 to 2011. 
And you know, some of the reasons that up for this growth are the rapid consumer adoption of digital technology. Um, and then there's also a, a lack of uh, brick and mortar sto stores, especially in the second and third tier cities in China. So a lot that's fueled the growth. Um, you know, people need to shop online because they can't always just pop down to the store, um, especially for the brands they're looking for. And by 2015, it's predicted that online transactions will reach 540 billion, or about 7.5% of the total e-commerce market in China, around the world. China will will achieve that. And by 2020, according to the Alibaba Research Group, China's e-commerce market is expected to surpass the combined e-commerce markets of the U.S., Great Britain, Germany, and France. And many of you have probably heard this before, but the founder of Alibaba, Jack Ma, has um, basically said, in other countries, e-commerce is a way to shop, and in China, it's a lifestyle. So great market for many, um, many global companies to reach China. Um, and another thing is online spending um, per consumer is growing in China. So the average amount spent online um, by buyer per year, China comes in ahead of every other country, at least in Asia PAC. And according to Forrester, the average online expenditure will reach about 1,000 US dollars by 2016, which doesn't, may not sound like much, but um, the census data shows the average disposable household income in China is about 3,000 US dollars, equivalent US dollars. So just a few points from the report um, that we'll cover is um, the Chinese buying frequently from overseas companies, looking for merchandise from overseas companies, not always internal China-based companies, um, looking for luxury goods, and also you know, the characteristic of being very demanding and, uh, and price conscious in a lot of cases. So basically, Ch Chinese online buyers shop frequently for overseas merchandise, and online purchases made via websites from outside of China have doubled, doubled annually over the past three years. And the demand is fueled in part by um, the cachet of foreign brands and wanting those foreign brands, but also in some, some ways the inherent distrust of certain domestic products. Chinese shoppers want to make sure that what they're buying is genuine and that it's safe to use. And a couple examples are they buy 10% of baby formula and 7% of makeup and skincare products through overseas websites or companies based outside of China. Another characteristic is they like luxury goods, avid buyers of luxury goods, and by next year, China is expected to be the world's largest market for luxury goods, generating 20% of all worldwide sales. They're also willing to spend a greater percentage of their disposable income on luxury goods, estimated at about 10 to 15%, and even comparing that to another area where luxury goods are popular in Japan, which only spends 4% of their disposable income. So that's good news. And of course, using online channels, mobile, online websites, uh, that's a very critical way to reach um, for foreign brands to connect with this growing base of luxury demand, especially in second and third tier cities where there aren't those brick and mortar stores. And the Chinese consumer is demanding, so you need to keep that in mind. Um, they like novelty, they want the best quality, but they're aggressive comparison shoppers. So they spend a lot of time doing research before making a purchase, than, a lot more time than do consumers in other countries. And more than 70% of Chinese consumers say they compare prices. And that's regardless of whether they're high income or low income, they, they want to compare prices. Um, so one way to overcome that is to, to have a very positive experience online, a well-designed, fast-loading website. Um, they like to do a lot of research, so having, having the ability to do that research to see what other people have said about the products is a really good thing to have. Um, but also you need to make sure it's fast, um, and that could, that could help um, for Chinese consumers to have more brand loyalty and be maybe a little less price conscious. So with all this good news, how can a brand fail in China? Well, one of the ways is to have a slow website. And the further away a website is hosted, um, the, the longer it's going to take to load in China. So if you're hosting a website from Europe or from the US and you have that one data center and origin server, 
um, you could basically take two to three seconds to load, you know, in the U.S. or Europe, wherever it is, or the U.K., but by the time you get to China, it could take 50, 60, 70 seconds for that same website to load. So having that slow website could be a point of failure in China. Another thing that everyone has to continue, contend with is the Great Firewall. And I, I'm sure probably everyone on the webcast is familiar with it. Um, but it's placed a, a, around China to basically protect its citizens from content. Um, and, the, you know, they're always looking at every website. So that adds 40% of more download time. So 40, websites are 40% slower. And Hong Kong um, is actually outside of China. So many companies think, well, I could build a data center in Hong Kong or I could host in Hong Kong. Well, that's outside of the firewall. So it's still going to add 40%. And another thing to be aware of with the firewall is block content. Um, so that's basically the point where the officials decide, you know, is this content appropriate for our our um, consumers in China. So what can you do? Um, so in, kind of to illustrate what this looks like, um, basically if you don't have a content delivery network or you're only hosting from one origin site, you're looking at going through a very inefficient website, the internet, a very inefficient internet. You go through the firewall. Once you're in China, you're experiencing poor peering between the ISPs. So if you're just, you know, hitting one ISP within China, and it, it could still take a long time to get even just 200 miles away because the ISPs don't peer well. So what a CDN provides is edge servers located close to your data center, no matter where it is, and then servers located close to your end users or the consumers that are going to access your content. It basically creates a fast, secure tunnel over the Internet so you can quickly deliver the, your website or applications to and from China. You don't have to build data centers, so you don't actually have to build any data centers within China or in Hong Kong or anywhere else because we already have the infrastructure. We've already built the network. Um, also, you want to make sure that you've got that in-country expertise, somebody that's looking at your content, making sure it's not going to get blocked, making sure that you're following regulations, which are constantly changing. So that's another thing that a CDN offers to, um, for reaching China. So just a little bit about CD networks. We have 25 points of presence in China. We've overcome that uh, unstable peering between the ISPs. We've strategically located these points of presence so that you don't experience that delay. Um, we basically have the con content expertise, um, licensing, regulation expertise, and we provide us the speed, security, and reliability uh, throughout China. And just one more thing um, to give you an example, um, valley.cn, valley and an, another thing you want to consider is always having a .cn website as well to serve into China. Um, but they were started running on CD Network's um, China infrastructure and reduced the page load times by 81% and improved that online shopping experience in China. So that's it for, the, for that presentation. All right, thank you so much, Sharon. Um, thank you for reviewing a bit about the market as well as some of the challenges um, that retailers can experience in the market. And we would like to now ask uh, both Newegg and Puma for their perspectives about some of the things that they've experienced in the market. Um, we'll start out with Audrey at Puma. How is the launch in China different from other entry strategies uh, internationally for you? Well, last question. Um, China has definitely be a different animal for us, and we had many things to consider uh, when entering this market. I think I'll, I'll more specifically talk about six aspects uh, that we had to consider, uh, and I think they are the main priorities for any brand wishing to enter the market. So first of all is the legal setup. Uh, I'll try to be simplistic because there can be a lot of subtleties behind it, and I don't want to, to make it more complex than it is, but most companies willing to sell online in China will have to get an ICP license or an ICP filing. It can be long and complex, so usually brands would apply through one of their local vendors, um, and this is what we did. Uh, the second thing that we had to consider is the technology architecture, and I won't repeat what 
Sharon just uh, presented, but basically you definitely need to account for China Great Firewall, uh, the bandwidth in China that varies greatly depending on the region. So you need to think through your server structure and most companies would sign up for a CDN service, which we did. Um, a third aspect is the logistics and fulfillment. If you opt for local fulfillment, because some brands may, may choose to ship from outside the country, um, then it's likely you'll be using a BPO. Uh, BPO stands for Business Process Outsourcing. So basically a vendor will manage most of the back-end functions on your behalf by uh, contracting with other vendors, basically. It's kind of similar to what we have in more mature markets with an end-to-end contract, but uh, the, the, the term that they use over there is BPO. Um, then I would say that one of the most important aspects that is different from any other um, entry strategy is that the sale channel is very different and marketplaces are dominating the market. And I think it's very crucial to realize that the B2C market is dominated by Timo, uh, so basically the Taobao group. Um, Timo, I think, is a little bit over 50% market share. Uh, Jingdong.com, which is kind of their Amazon equivalent, has over 17% market share. So the marketplace model completely dominates, and the Chinese market is not a standalone branded store market yet, at least for brands like, like Puma. I guess it's, it may be different for luxury brands that are not sold anywhere else, but for brands like us, uh, we really had to consider that environment and that context to be successful in China. Um, also because this marketplace domination has set the path for a lot of localization habits uh, that have to be incorporated into your strategy. So as Sharon mentioned, uh, this is a very discount-driven market. We had to, you know, play with promotions and, and make sure that we would accommodate the 11-11 event in China and so on. Um, also, it's very important to disclose a lot of information, a lot of reinsurance on the site in general, and the importance of reviews, uh, also because Timo um, has a lot of reviews and it's very crucial to, to, to the customer to, to reassure them in his purchase. Um, also, in terms of localization, um, you need to make sure that you adjust your checkout and you adjust your payment methods. Uh, COD, cash on delivery, and Alipay, for instance, are two, uh, two main payment methods for us that we observe on the site. And I would say that finally, uh, the sixth aspect to consider is that you need to adjust your marketing strategy and your local standard, to the local standards. Um, Baidu is dominating the market, the search engine market. So everything you know about Google, you need to forget, you need to learn again. Uh, same goes for the social platforms. Uh, they are different, but at the same time, they, have, they, they are really completely part of the shopping experience, and, and I think even more so than in the major markets. Okay, perfect. So we're going to go into our next question for you. How did you adjust your entry strategy then for facing those challenges? Um, well, taking all of the previous aspects into consideration, we adjusted our entry strategy by launching uh, the Puma site on marketplaces first before we launched our own operated website. So we launched uh, first on Tmall uh, back in August 2011, actually. Um, then we launched on Jingdong in May 2013. And finally, we launched our standalone site late August 2013 for a soft launch and uh, with additional marketing traction uh, pretty recently in February 2014. So basically entering the market through Timo first um, allowed us to go live quickly because, you know, it's kind of a no-brainer that when you go on Timo, everything is set up for the brand to be able to launch um, pretty quickly. Um, also, you can benefit from a very natural traffic with uh, over 50% market share. I mean, Timo is a search engine for consumers in China. Uh, when they want to buy something and compare products, they would go on to Timo, so you would really benefit from that uh, leverage. 
um, then it allowed us to build our back uh, our back end and fulfillment backbone um, and start building a team and start you know progressing um, along a learning curve. Uh, then from that experience on Timo, we were able to launch on Jingdong.com, which is fairly similar, although the positioning and the mentality can, can be a little bit different, and, and so most recently our standalone site. Okay, great. Now kind of thinking um, past your entry strategy, what were some of the main challenges that you encountered? Um, so overall, the main challenge is really to forget everything you know from other markets, especially mature markets, and just think with the new requirements that you are given. Um, I think we've been facing most challenges with our standalone site, not necessarily with the marketplaces, uh, for two main reasons. A, the Chinese customer is not very, very used to buying outside of marketplaces. Uh, at least, again, for brands like Puma, uh, and this may be different for luxury brands that are not available on marketplaces anyway. Um, and the second reason also is that the vendors or even our local teams are still on a learning curve when it comes to the strategy behind the management of our on-site, uh, the dynamic, the pricing dynamic, the merchandising, uh, even the promotion of the site. Um, in terms of very concrete challenges, and coming back to the points I mentioned earlier, I would say that, of course, the legal um, part and the technology aspects, so the servers, are the main pain points, especially as you need to deal with these two items uh, at the beginning where you're still evaluating your strategy, and these are really two pain points that you need to go through um, at the early stage of your, of your development. Um, in, and again, in terms of less frontal challenges, I would say again that business can be difficult for standalone sites. Uh, the maturity of the market is overall not at the level that people may expect. So numbers are big in China, undoubtedly, and I think that Sharon highlighted that very well. Uh, numbers are big, but again, marketplaces are still dominating. And and also because everybody has been formatted by that marketplace business, it's fairly difficult to find human resources, vendors, etc. who understand the principles, the principles of running a standalone site, uh, and the strategy is really different. And I would say that finally, the landscape is changing very rapidly, um, from you know the vendors present on the market to new brands entering. Um, new, new everything. So you need to be prepared to change and adjust very rapidly all the time to the point where your contracts can change and you need to be ready to renegotiate and adjust the terms of your contract in the middle of the contract because you know, the context would have changed dramatically. So you need to constantly look at your business, your numbers, talk to your vendors, and this can be different from what you experience in other countries. Okay, understood. And um, kind of putting those challenges in perspective, um, we would like to speak a little bit to the use of CDNs and the importance of using a CDN. Um, yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. Um, for us, it has never been a debate. Uh, the Great Firewall is such a risk for a site. And the concern uh, back, back in you know back in the time when we started working on that project, the concern of the site going black uh, for us was you know adding to the anxiety of the speed and the performance of our site. So we knew we needed a CDN, uh, but more importantly, you need to make sure that the servers are covering the whole Chinese territory with a good coverage outside of Tier One and Tier Two cities. And we had to make sure that we had a good balance between the north of the country, the south, to be able to really cover um, most of the of the territory. Uh, so yeah, we we our our servers, uh, our main point of delivery is, is actually in Hong Kong, and then we use um, a, a CDN service and with uh, servers located in mainland China. Okay. Thank you so much, Audrey, uh, for that great overview. Now we would like to um, ask a question of Aaron um, at Newegg. Um, 
So, Aaron, we're going to talk through um, some best practices. Uh, can you provide some of the important lessons learned in terms of marketing channels, site design, and brand positioning uh, for this market? Uh, yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so, uh, you know, Newegg actually entered uh, in China since like 2001. Uh, about the same time as we launched the website in the USA. Um, so uh, a lot of things we have done in China, and but today, you know, mostly, you know, the the, the, the questions will be answered by myself, you know, from my my own perspective, not necessarily from uh, what we learned from New Egg, right? Um, and uh, just because I came from China, uh, I actually work in China since 2005, and. Uh, and then you know um, came to uh, USA in 2007. So I have been in the USA for about seven years. Uh, what I have observed about marketing, uh, you know, marketing in China, I, I think you know a lot of things are different uh, from what we have in USA or other markets. So in terms of marketing channels, uh, of course, the first thing I would like to mention is email marketing. Email marketing may not work as you expected. You know in USA. Um, delivery rate, uh, delivery rate, and also open rate, click to open rate, are much higher than well, what you could have in China. That's something you guys need to uh, you know pay attention to when you enter uh, into uh, you know uh, China market. And um, you know, about affiliate marketing, I would say you know it depends on what you're uh, you're, you're selling and what you uh, who you're selling to. Uh, affiliate mar marketing could be very useful, very. Uh, uh, you know, helpful when you enter into um, the market. If you're sending to uh, the deal junkies, let's say, you know, deal junkies means you know people are very deal driven and they are very sensitive about the price. Then that's a very good channel for you to use. And uh, and 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 like uh, I think Sharon just mentioned, uh, you know, the uh, the uh, Baidu uh, is the most powerful one. Uh, in China for search marketing, and you have to forget about whatever you learned you know, about Google, and you have to restart to learn um, the Baidu system. And uh, social, um, social marketing. Uh, I, I don't know if you guys, uh, you know, uh, uh, have thought about that, but social marketing actually is uh, really powerful in China. And you have to uh, probably partner with some local partners uh, to do some social marketing. Um, if you can see that, you know, even JD, uh, JD dot com, I mean Jindong, um, when the company went um, IPO, there are quite a few uh, events. Let's say, um, let's call that events online. You know, some stories about some love stories about the founder and a uh, uh, very popular, uh, let's say, superstar. <laughs> Not superstar, but she's very popular on social actually. Um, so that's some stories um, you, you could utilize for your. For your brand when you enter in the market, and it's very popular. I mean, this kind of um, event marketing is very popular in China. And uh, another thing, uh, you, you, uh, I think we just talk, talk about the site design. One thing you guys probably already uh, noticed that is the site design is. I would say the site design is busier than what we have in USA. So in USA, the site uh, we would like to design a site in a clean way, right? Um, less is more, but in China you can see that particularly some retail websites, a lot of content, a lot of rich content, a lot of pictures, and that's how we shop in China. That's you know as a Chinese, Chinese that's definitely the way I shop in China too. And, um, and the other thing about the product review, uh, in China there are always some like point system to incentivize you guys to get some uh, some points when you um, uh, buy some reviews. And if you um, you work as a center in Taobao, Tmall, or some other uh, marketplace, uh, you probably would like uh, you know you invite your customers, remind your customers to write some positive reviews for you, um, because that really matter when you sell to other guys. Um, so that's a, that's some some information I, I could provide. Uh, and and uh, the very last thing, but it's very important thing is it depends how you position yourself. No matter you are a retail. Or you actually sell some luxury uh, goods in China. It depends on uh, how you deposition your your products. Uh, China is a huge market. It's in it's very diversified. Um, so um, if you're selling to uh, to deal junkies, or you're you're selling to some uh, let's say 
um, the people in the uh, teal bomb cities, um, the, the strategy that you have brand position could be very different. So uh, do some good research about you know about the product you're selling and who you're selling to, and then define uh, good, you know pos uh, define your position of your brand. And then um, I would like I would like to suggest you work with some local partners, find the right right uh, partner to work with. That's that's very helpful for you to add into the market. Yeah, I don't know if that's. Uh, No, I think that's, that's uh, perfect. Some great, um, some great tips and best practices for the audience. Thank yeah. you so much, Aaron. Um, so now we have a few questions uh, for Sharon uh, at CD Networks. Um, so Sharon, first question for you: What are some site performance challenges your e-commerce site customers have told you um, about that are associated with reaching online shoppers in China? Yeah, I think we've covered a lot of this. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, but basically, I think when people come to us, they, they don't realize um, a lot, you know, they, they haven't done or realized how much of a challenge it is as far as the performance of a website, as far as what the firewall does, as far as kind of the ISPs not peering correctly. So they're just saying, you know, hey, we want to reach China. We know it's a great market, but, um, you know, our content was blocked or it doesn't seem to be available or it's super slow. Um, so, you know, then we help to educate them about, well, here's why you actually have to have servers within China that are serving within China, not, you know, outside the firewall. You need to ensure that your content meets these criteria. You need to get the licensing, as Audrey mentioned. I mean, that's very, you have to have the ICP or BN, whatever licenses are appropriate to what you're selling and what you're presenting. Um, so, you know, it's kind of an education thing that we have to, they, they don't always know what their challenges are. Um, but performance, you know, that's, that's an easy one to solve. It's, you know, mostly latency related. And once we get them running on the infrastructure in China and overcoming the peering, um, the performance is, is one that's easy to fix. It's everything else <laughs> along with that content blocked um, licensing, all of that that also needs to be overcome. So. All right, perfect. Um, and a final question for you, Sharon, a uh, final prepared question. What are e-commerce sites doing to overcome network challenges in China? Basically running on a CDN that has infrastructure in China, um, that's, you know, the, the only – you could go build, you know, 25 data centers in China um, or try and co-locate, but um, it's so much easier just to flip a switch and, and run on someone else's network. You know, there are other things involved, obviously, but – um, it's very quick. Um, all the content that can be um, that can be cached, you know, and stored on the servers closer to the end users in China, that that happens. And then dynamic content um, is much more efficient to make it to the end users in China. So, really having that infrastructure, that partner with a CDN, is the way to overcome the challenges. All right, great. Um, well, I'd like to thank. Sharon, Audrey, and Aaron. Um, that's the end of our prepared questions. Um, we do have a lot of time uh, for audience questions. Just as a reminder, you can submit your questions using the Q&A tab. Um, and we'll, we'll wrap up uh, with the audience Q&A. Um, I do have a question for Sharon here. Do I still need a content delivery network that specializes in reaching China if I already use an e-commerce platform? And that's for yeah, Sharon. So, uh Okay. Um, E-commerce platforms are great. They add, you know, the sizzle to the websites. Um, they they add all those fantastic features, which you know, content delivery network doesn't do any of that. We're we're just basically the the network to run on um, and cache and and increase dynamic uh, content, you know, delivery and shorten that delivery time. Um, but uh, the e-commerce the e platforms, they, they have multiple data centers, but um, most of them don't have the infrastructure that we've built within China and globally, really. Um, so, you know, and, and sometimes those features actually can add more time to a website, more loading time. Um, so it's even more important to have a content delivery network and even more important to um, provide that um, that you know reach throughout the world globally and those points of presence like we have 140 points of presence so it's even more important to serve the content on a CDN um, when you're using you know all of the features that are provided by a platform okay great 
Um, and again, if anyone has any questions um, from the audience, you could submit them using the, uh, the Q&A tab. Um, one question that I would actually like to, uh, to pose to the group, um, if you had to leave the audience with just one kind of key takeaway from this webinar, you know, one really, really important fact, something that they can kind of implement right away, um, do each of you have a thought as to what that one key takeaway could be to offer to the audience? And maybe we could start with Audrey. Sure. Well, I would say my main takeaway would be twofold. Um, for any brand wishing to enter the market, the China market, I would say that the first question to, to ask internally is whether you want to serve the market from within mainland China or from the outside. This will then uh, you know, make your whole strategy vary greatly. So I would say this is the first question you need to ask yourself. And then depending on that strategy, um, then I think the second important one will be depending on your brand positioning and depending on, on what also the internal strategy is within your brand is do you want to get into the market uh, via marketplace, a marketplace first, or do you want to enter the market through your own standalone site? I would say these are the two main questions that any brand should you know, ask internally before moving any further. Okay, great. And Aaron, can you offer just one kind of key takeaway for the audience, maybe one best practice that you feel like would be really important for people? Um, this Aaron. Um, the one, one keyword I would like to provide is localization. So no matter you work with partners or uh, you would like to uh, you know, build up your own website to sell directly, uh, you, know, you need to hire employees. I would like to suggest you know, find the right partners in uh, the local market and um, you know, hire the employees there and give them the authority to work with, work with the market, work for the market. Uh, and also, the localization could cover the customer segments too. So, depend, like I said, depends on who you sell to, because that's a huge market and it's a very diversified market. So, you need to define, um, you know, position your brand and then, you know, define the segments you would like to provide the service to, right? And also, uh, that would affect the you know, marketing channels you use too. So, uh, keep the localization in mind. You know, uh, I don't. You know, there are a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, lessons learned from other companies who entered the market and then failed and then left left the market, right? I think the most important thing or the most important lesson learned from that is localization. How do you, uh, you know, define your your brand positioning? How do you uh, find the right partner at the local market and also give authority to local employees and serve the right uh, customer segments for your brand? utilize the marketing channels uh, correctly. Yeah, so localization is the one word, uh, one keyword I would like to remind everyone to keep in mind when you enter the market. Okay, great. Yeah, that's it. Um, mm -hmm. Two great uh, perspectives there. Um, Sharon, is there the one key takeaway that we can leave the audience with uh, before we wrap up the webinar? Sure. I'm just going to echo what, what Aaron said, because in addition to running on a CDN with the infrastructure, you really have to learn about the, the consumer over there and what you're selling and who you're selling to and what they want to see. And obviously the language needs to be localized. Um, I think even some companies, you know, potentially make that mistake. You have to localize the language. Having a .cn if you choose to go with your own website is very important. Um, making sure the images are, are correct and, you know, that they'll comply with regulations as well as what consumers there want to see. Um, making sure there's a, the ability to research and to find out more about the products, um, to have, you know, what a, uh, what a um, retail or e-commerce platform could provide as well, you know, that you have reviews, you have the 360-degree views of, of products. Um, I think just having a lot of information all in the local language, localization, very important. Okay, great. Um, and with that, we are going to conclude um, our webinar. 
Um, again, we would like to thank all of you for attending. Um, we would like to thank CD Networks, um, the sponsor for uh, today's webinar. Um, it was brought to you by eTail um, and WBR Digital as well as CD Networks. We'd also like to thank our panelists, um, Aaron Yin from Newegg and Audrey Cassine from Pula. Um, and I hope everybody has left with some really, really valuable information about this market and some of the challenges you might experience as well as how to work through those challenges. Um, we look forward to seeing everyone again um, at one of our future webinars. Thank you all so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you.